idea that raw competition between all players in all domains is a good and workable organizing principle for the world economy and polity has also gained considerable ground in recent decades. Those voices on the international scene calling for an open world market and for the integration of all countries in the global economy through free trade and the free movement of capital have been louder and more effective than the voices arguing for more prudent, orderly and participatory construction of an open and interdependent world community of nations. Solidarity among unequal members of the international community tends to be a soft social value that should motivate humanitarian actions, but certainly not be a factor in the development of an efficient, dynamic world economy. Within the interests, within the United Nations itself, forces representing narrow, narrow national and class interests and views have precluded democratic debate and the achievement of a consensus on what constitutes the common good. As it is no longer possible for nations to remain independent of one another, defining the common good has become an absolute necessity, notwithstanding the global solidarity and mobilization that have characterized the pursuit of the Millennium Development Goals the United Nations is clearly facing huge obstacles in its efforts to promote and preserve international equity and equality. From the perspective of the contribution of the United Nations to the pursuit and achievement of equity and equality, there are two main justifications for making a conceptual distinction between global and international efforts. First, the traditional activities of the United Nations, in particular those relating to human rights and development, have largely reflected a focus on people rather than on their countries of citizenship. For example, efforts to reduce the incidence of HIV are typical of a global approach to a global problem. The Millennium, the Millennium Declaration incorporates a global poverty reduction target, but does not explicitly address the issue of inequality, including inequality between developed and developing countries. Finally, the Charter of the United Nations, signed by nations committing themselves to a global compact for cooperation, is largely based on the presumption of a fundamental universality of values and aspirations. The second reason for differentiating between the global and international nature of United Nations efforts to promote equity and equality is that since the adoption of the Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there has been a steady and significant increase in problems and threats, expectations and opportunities, and forces and powers that extend beyond national borders. There have been developed technologies that allow human beings to engage in massive murder and destruction virtually anywhere in the world, while other technologies have made worldwide communication and travel much faster and easier, effectively reducing the distances that separate communities and people. Such developments have changed human perceptions of the world in which they live. The environmental damage owing to human activities have given rise to a global consciousness that the Earth's shared resources must be preserved and protected. A third generation of human rights focusing on the collective rights of people and including the right to peace, the right to development and the right to a healthy environment have been elaborated before being pushed aside by the currently dominant ideology multinational and transnational corporations have developed their own global strategies and have strengthened their global influence. Humanitarian concerns have acquired a universal dimension. 
There are global forces promoting selfishness, greed, and the raw exercise of power. However, there is also a global movement driven by the conviction that the fundamental human objectives of freedom and security can only be reconciled through the achievement of global equality and equity. In this configuration of global forces, opportunities and threats, the United Nations is a struggling actor. It must identify, promote and defend global values while also promoting tolerance, diversity and pluralism. In its normative role, it must distinguish truly universal values, principles and rights from ideas and policy orientations that reflect specific interests, beliefs, convictions and prejudice. It must also play a leading role within a network of international organizations that have different mandates and constituencies and in some cases more power. It must try to convince its most powerful members to respect the rules and culture of multilateralism. In recent years, faced with a dominant view among concerned parties that the activities of private economic and financial forces should not be subjected to international laws and regulations, the United Nations has endeavored to convince these forces that it is in their best interest to voluntarily abide by certain universal principles. The United Nations has also offered more space in both its normative and operational activities to organizations of civil society in order to pave the way for the emergence of a global form of democracy. Tied in with the pursuit of global equity and democracy are proposals for various types of global taxes and this kind of taxes that would help finance global programs representing a concrete manifestation of world solidarity and redistribution. Above all, Perhaps the United Nations has been struggling to play an effective role in the identification, prevention, control and reduction of global inequalities and inequities and to preserve the fundamental principle of the equality of sovereign nations in the rapidly changing world. Since 1960s, United Nations efforts to reduce national inequities and inequalities have focused on what we or on what were originally called underdeveloped and later developing countries. Normative texts reflect an overt emphasis on universal coverage and universal intent. In times past, developed countries would report on any progress achieved in the implementation of international instruments they had ratified in the domain of equity and equality, such as the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the Covenant on Social, Economic and Cultural Rights. Texts such as the Copenhagen Declaration have had some impact in the more affluent countries, particularly with regard to the issues of social exclusion and poverty. However, in terms of international cooperation in the economic, social, cultural and humanitarian affairs, the United Nations has concentrated almost exclusively on providing development assistance to the South. The funds and programs directly linked to the organization have as their mandate the channeling of resources and various forms of technical assistance to developing countries. Other international organizations, in particular the World Trade Organization and the Bretton Woods institutions, strongly influence the national policies of a large number of developing countries through the norms and agreements they establish and through the advice and conditions attached to their loans and other forms of financial assistance. The direct contributions of the United Nations to the development and social progress of developing, of developing countries are conceptually and politically linked to the pursuit of international equity. Such support should gradually diminish and eventually disappear as higher levels of development are achieved. To some extent, this explains the current focus of development cooperation 
on the least developed countries. Development cooperation must take into account the principle of national responsibility for development as well as the recognized need for diversity and respect for differences in traditions and political cultures. Prescriptions and injections for all countries, and not only developing countries, should perhaps be firm on the general principles of equity and equality derived from basic negotiated texts precise on technical points such as, such as the various methods of measuring inequality or poverty and very restrained with regard to the objectives and concrete policies that should be pursued. So far, as you may have understood, we don't have any success story when it comes to international uh, organizations in their efforts to achieve social justice, equality, or equity. This is not because international organizations are weak factors in the international community. It is mainly because the driving force when it comes to national policies is the national interest that is defended by national policies, by foreign ministries, and other centers. John Maynard Keynes, in the mid-war period, stated something that I consider that it is essential. He said that the political problem of mankind is to combine economic efficiency, social justice, and individual liberty. Now, this is the mission, this is the goal to be achieved. If this is a mission impossible for the international organizations, that means that we should have a more active participation of states towards this goal. Thank you very much.